I just sent it to you. You should get it. Okay, thank you. Hey everyone, Catherine and I are going to get started in just a couple of minutes, um, or less than that, actually, like 30 seconds. So uh, you, you're in the right place if you came to the nonprofit coffee talk. We are happy to have you today and look forward to this conversation. I'm super excited today to um, talk with Catherine. She has a really, really awesome topic and it's different, which I love. It's going to challenge our thinking. So um, we will get started in just a couple seconds. Grab your last uh, cup of coffee or water or whatever you need to make this more comfortable for you. We're down to about 20 seconds. We'll get going. I wish I had a coffee. I know, me too, actually. I was like, man, I need a coffee. I'm right at the end of COVID. Um, and so a coffee would be great because I'm just a Something little hot. My throat has been hurting the last two days too. So I, I made myself this amazing, like, just like hot water with ginger and lemon yesterday. And I was like, oh, oh I could have made that this morning. Forgot. That sounds good. I had some green tea this morning. I, I actually weaned myself off of coffee because I think it's been causing me tummy troubles, but. I, don't I just know. drink half because it's just an addiction. And so mm -hmm. I just love the taste of coffee. That's I that, do too. The routine of the boiling of the water, the making I the coffee. It. It's just part of my I agree. And I have the whole setup. I have the uh, I have this great coffee grinder and mm -hmm. I've been doing a pour over, was doing a pour over recently, but um Stop it. We have to stop talking about it. I know. It's making me want some <laughs> coffee. All right. Let's go ahead and get started. <laughs> hey, everyone. I'm Libby V, nonprofit champion and founder of Libby V and Associates. And through visioning and strategy work, leadership, coaching, development, support, and organizational board development, our nonprofit leader clients successfully raise more money and have more impact. But not all nonprofits can afford to hire a consultant. So I created the nonprofit Coffee Talk as a way to provide great content and helpful information to as many nonprofit people as I can. I hope you find it useful. Um, please feel free to anytime to message me and suggest other topics or speakers you'd like to see on the show. And if that's you, great. I'd love to talk with you. So um I am at the tail end of COVID, so I sound congested. I apologize for the sinusy voice, but that's just what it is. Um, I'm so excited today to have as a guest Catherine McDonald with Just Be Cause Consulting, and I love the name of your business, by the way. Um, and she's here today to talk about a really interesting topic, which is non-human philanthropy, the specifics of working in a nonprofit that serves animals and the environment. And there are some nuances there, um, and we're going to talk about those. So super excited to have you today, Catherine. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, my pleasure. So just a little bit about Catherine. She's a social sector renaissance woman. I love that. Oh, my gosh. I wish I would have thought of that. Um, <laughs> my descriptor. Um, her zone of genius is fundraising and communications. She's head of communications for a national philanthropy research network and philanthropy consultant with a unique specialty in getting people excited about fundraising strategy, particularly around grant making. And if you don't have a strategy with your fundraising and especially with your grant making, not especially, but also with your grant making, because that gets overlooked so much, the strategy part, um, you need one. Um, so having worked in the nonprofit and philanthropic worlds for the past 15 years, Catherine confidently tackles well-traversed and unique challenges alike, all the while making the process not just painless, but enjoyable for the people she works with. I have no doubt after meeting you. <laughs> um, Catherine's passion expertise is non-human philanthropy defined as all philanthropic initiatives aimed towards animals and the natural world. I love it. I, as I told you when we met, I have a, th those two things are very near and dear to my heart. So um, I am just as excited about this topic as our get, as our uh, watchers and, and uh, listeners are out there. So listen, I'm going to ask you the first question and we'll get started. What yes, are the specific obstacles faced by non-human philanthropic nonprofits? So what a lot of people, when they ask when I, why I call it non-human, of course, it's, it's all connected. Do not get me wrong. I'm very aware that the animal world and the human world are connected. But what I really want to focus on is the philanthropic sector that is really geared towards 
animal welfare, animal rights, or environmental actions, even if it does have an impact on humans, there's still this perception, and that is one of the main obstacles, is that there is still this seeming perception of if you're caring about animals, it's because you don't care about humans. And I'm um, just going to give a, a little example of how this kind of plays out sometimes in the sector in I was uh, doing fundraising. You know, those annoying people on the streets that are like, hey, you want to sign up for a monthly donation? Well, that was me about 10 years ago when I started more my, my fundraising journey. And I remember one day and I was, I was, I was getting people to sign petitions against um, puppy mills. So when they were doing forced reproduction of, of dogs in very horrible conditions. And this man, just when I asked him to sign, he stops me, literally spits at my feet and says, how could you be protecting animals when there's children dying in, and there's this war happening in Syria at the time? And that just got me to realize how there seems to be this conflict of if you want to defend animals, then you don't want to defend humans. And I think that is one of the biggest, maybe from a thought perspective, one of the biggest challenges that a lot of people working in the sector need to face. And it is so far from the truth. And that is why I'm trying to get more knowledge and education around the fact that by becoming more empathetic and including more beings and even the non-sentient beings, if we talk about ecosystems, the environment, species, instead of thinking about individuals, how all of that just increases our, our capacity to take care of our world, including humans, because we are a part of it. We, we cannot separate the two. So I think that's one of the, one of the main obstacles that I find yeah. is stopping the world. That is a big challenge too, because there is there is a rift that exists, uh, and we can't pretend it doesn't, right? Or there's there's misconceptions about it or something. What do you, how define it for us? Like, how do you think about it in terms of this divide amongst the people and the you know the, the focus on people versus the focus on the environment and, and, and animal? Well, there's there's another example of the opposite is also true, which just creates a self-reinforcing cycle. When I was working in um, my local animal shelter, when I started working in, in, in a long time ago, <laughs> 2008, I would say, to start working uh, more directly in services. So I wasn't doing the fundraising part. I was really working directly as a receptionist. So doing the intakes of animals, doing the adoption, the foster care. So I was really dealing more with the public at the time. And one of the number one sentences I heard from volunteers, from the workers was, oh, I hate humans. And I was like, oh, wow, that's really depressing. You know, like we, we would focus a lot on all of the, the cruelty that we would see, a lot of the neglect. But then again, who was volunteering so many hours to walk the dogs to make sure that they were able to go out? Who was doing the adoption? Who was doing the, 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 the reception work? Who was adopting out the animals? Who was fostering right. the animals? It was humans. <laughs> so how could we say we hate humans? We hate certain behaviors. But we cannot say we hate humans because we are part of the solution. The fact that people have gotten together to create these organizations, these nonprofits that come into aid to these animals or to the environment, well, that shows that there is good. Well, I do believe that we have good in the world and we just have to focus on that. So one of the projects I did to kind of switch that around was I made this huge mural. I took pictures of people with their adopted animals, with their foster animals to really focus on, okay, but these are humans too. And these are people that are part of the solution. The problem is not um, focusing on, on all the people that are causing harm. It's about how can we bring them into the group of people that care? And I think that we have to stop hating people so we can actually start including them in the process of often what is neglect come, it can come from lack of education about what these animals actually need. It's mm -hmm. not necessarily that everyone's a psychopath that wants to cause harm to humans right. or animals. That's so right. there's a lack of education and that's a big part of also one of the obstacles is there's not as much education. I think it's, it, it is increasing with time. There has been an improvement, but there's not as much education on the non-human world. We're so focused on how can we help humans? How can we help humans? So we, we kind of yeah. disconnect of how we are part of this larger system that taking mm -hmm. care of animals and understanding their needs will also benefit humans so that mm -hmm. it's not one or the other. So that's another one of the things that I found that was, um, kind of hard to deal with in that sector. Yeah, that, yeah, there. Yeah, I've, I mean, I've been involved with on the periphery of, of, of dog rescue, right? And, um, and, and I do hear that, right? Like humans are evil, and I hate humans and stuff. And a lot of times, if you really look at those cases, you know, even hoarding animal hoarding cases, you know, most, most people don't intend harm, they just get in over their heads, or they have a mental illness. Um, and 
you know, or they have too much stress in their lives, or there's something there, they've been traumatized, and the trauma takes over, you know, there's just a lot to it, we can't just dismiss a whole, you know, the whole species of human beings, you know, as bad, because it's, it's not, it's not, it's not the case, there are some people that do harm animals, and that needs attention, because they're likely to harm humans, but, you know, it's it's not the case, normally. That's even connected to the general justice system, which let's not go down too far into that path, but right, 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 right. The sense that we judge people on their actions instead of understanding yeah. the system in which they were brought up. So for example, that's you, exactly right. you bring up the hoarding issue. So it often comes from a desire to care for these animals and they don't want to get rid of them because they think that they're the only ones that are going to take care of them properly. Yeah. And then, like you say, it gets out of hand. Cats can have a lot of kittens. It's not, it's very fast. Like you can right. easily go from two to 20 within yeah. a year and then yeah. it becomes too much and there, there's this just vicious cycle of also this shame the that we've been creating and perpetuating in the non-human philanthropy sector of shaming people for not being perfect of not knowing everything of not that i think needs to change there needs to be more of an understanding and a listening an active listening to the people so that we can actually get out of this is our is our goal to solve the problem or mm-hmm. to just be on our high horse of well we're the only ones that actually care and so we can take care of the animals and you cannot and there's there's this elitism that I don't really like in the sector that I think needs to change so we can actually get everyone involved in solving the problem. And it goes both ways. I think that both people need to learn to meet in the middle and stop being so extreme. There's a lot of hate on animal lovers of being anti-human, of not caring, which is wrong. It's not true. It's because we care, they care too much or they care just more yeah. about different species. And that can also come from trauma. Maybe humans Right. We're not very nice to them. So they have more of a connection with animals. And then the other mm-hmm. hand of the people that care for animals of hating everyone else. Why do we hate each other? This should be about spreading more love and more empathy. And to maybe bring it also to the environmental aspect, because for me, it goes further than that of the same things I've noticed in the environmental sector of people striving for perfection and like judging each other often on, oh, you have a car. Oh, you do this negative behavior for the environment. And we have, I understand where it comes from. It comes from this fear that we have of our, our environment is, is going down the drain, that we're polluting it. I understand that that's where it comes from. But I do not believe that that is the solution of how to get more people involved in the movement and understanding if we are not able to understand people where they are. So that's another big obstacle, I feel, of this constant judgment of being perfect. Mm-hmm. No one's perfect. <laughs> like, no. it's just... It's not. And I think that we need to switch that into becoming more understanding. And I understand we feel like there's this crisis. There is. But I do not feel that the solution is to let's get hate on other people. It's to get people in, involved and understanding to, and meeting people where they're at and getting them to be like, okay, how can we work on this? And yeah. so we can go forward. So that's one of the other obstacles that I've noticed in the sector is this constant sense of competition of who is the most animal friendly, who is the yeah. most vegan, Who is the most Mm eco-friendly? And I think that that is something that has been kind of self-digesting, if I can say, the the sector and not necessarily Mm -hmm. being able to push it forward. Yeah, that's such a great point. Um, It becomes this very closed club, you know, that you have to be fit in or not. Like there's no gray area. It's just like you're in or you're out. Um, And you're right, we're all human and we're not going to be perfect, you know, in the way that we interact with the environment or with animals um, or any other living species. But, you know, just trying, right, to do our best is, is what we, is all we can ask of people. So tell me what you're doing in this space, because I was fascinated when I met with you just the work that you're doing. I think it's really cool work and I want people to understand um, how you're approaching this with your your consulting business. Thank you. Um, so when I was a young activist, <laughs> when I was in those, those, those times of the best way to support the thing would be to go out in the streets and to be an activist and to go on TV, to go into the media. And I did it for a couple of years. Then I became exhausted emotionally and physically yeah. just drained. And I realized because I love fundraising, I love grant. I know I'm, I'm weird. I love fundraising. I get excited about fundraising. It's 
for me, it's about inviting people to invest in a cause that they believe in. So I see it as an education and awareness building by also transferring more resources to the movement so that they can build it. Because a lot of people don't realize how, especially I'll give a concrete example. I'm the president of the board of Vigilance OGM, which is a nonprofit that's fighting against uh, GMOs and very heavy pesticide use that are often associated with GMOs. And there we're, we're a three person team with a budget of under $400,000 a year. And they're the only group lobbying against pesticides in all of Quebec. You see this organization like, yeah, I could give all of my energy into working with them. Or what I could do is support them into growing their funds so that they can become a stronger, stronger team. But if I do it just for one organization, that's great. I do one cause. But by being a consultant and empowering and transmitting all of the knowledge I have to different organizations, I can have so much more impact. So for me, it was almost about being efficient in my own impact on the world by helping and supporting organizations that are great at the cause, kind of suck on the fundraising aspect, which is something that is common to many organizations. Oh, yeah. Motivated, passionate beings that are experts in their domain, but have don't know how to run a nonprofit necessarily. And that's mm-hmm. perfectly normal. You can't be an expert on everything. Right. So my objective as a consultant is to help nonprofits understand to, how they can be more efficient in their fundraising, how to get excited about fundraising, and how to implement fundraising into every aspect of their organization. Yeah. You have to break down these silos. I'll give a concrete example of when I was working in a shelter in the shelter in Montreal. And I was working at the reception and we always asked, there was always a donation blurb on the intake sheets for animals that people were abandoning or bringing in as strays. And I just was like, do we ask? Like, has anyone ever actually asked anyone for a donation? Or we just expect people to out of, just generously donate out of the sheer you know, generosity of their heart? And I was so I started to ask, and I remember one woman, she brought in two stray kittens, and she obviously cared. She was like, I'm trying to get the mom so I can sterilize her so we can stop having these problems. And I asked, oh, well, would you like to donate to, to the shelter to help us, you know, find more, you know, find animal, find, find a, a foster home or find a, an adoptive home? She's like, sure. And she gave $250, just yeah. like that. Yeah. And I realized, imagine if everyone who was working in direct services had this fundraising mindset and could implement that into their services, we would have much more of a contact with these, with the fundraising department and stop working in silos of like, oh, well, there's fundraising and they give us the money to allow us to do the real work. It's not separated. Fundraising is part right. of the services you offer because you would that's not be right. able to offer without it. So anyways, that, that's one of the examples that I found it's that a I'm great sure example. To understand. Yeah, that connection. Yeah. And it's not, it's yeah. not done, unfortunately. I feel like, um, you know, a lot of, um, nonprofit organizations are started with this passion to make a difference, right? Whether no matter what the cause is, um, and and you're right, a lot of people are really great at doing that. But when it comes to running sort of the business side of the organization, they that's not where their passion lies, or their or may and maybe their knowledge. Um, but it's important because they're not gonna they're not gonna exist without that. And I feel like it's even it's even elevated among um, environmental and animal welfare groups. I really do. I see it even even on steroids, you know, more than um, more than typical kind of traditional service organizations or working with humans. Um, do you see that? Do you do you does that seem to be relevant, or am I overplaying that? I have mostly worked with animal and environment organizations. So it's hard for me to say if it's the same in others. What I do think is that the philanthropic sector is not made to support those organizations as much. So I feel like there's not as much education towards those causes and support given for them to grow and to develop. So one of the main things I talk about when I talk about non-human philanthropy is should we even be using the term philanthropy? Because if we look, if you look at the definition of philanthropy, it's actually phil for love and then anthropy for humans, the so love of humans. And so it's very much focused on supporting human activities. Yeah. And unfortunately, a lot of the actions and, and demands, if I could say, and, and causes in the animal and, and environmental world come into conflict with what we would consider human activities. So for I've used the example of 
breeders, animal breeders that some of them are not evil people. It's just their right. business. Yeah. But if you look at the animal rights movement, they will say, well, that's, you know, that's wrong. And I'm not here to judge yes or no. I'm just saying that these come into conflict. The environmental mm -hmm. movement uh, comes into conflict with so many of our human ac economic activities. Mm -hmm. So it kind of becomes like, once again, we're bringing up this against humans um, like that. Yeah, that concept. Mm -hmm. So philanthropy, if you look at the, the way, especially in, in Canada, at least the definition of, 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 of what is considered charitable, which is like one of the parts of philanthropy is you have to prove that it, it kind of comes back and supports humans. So even in animal shelter, the only reason they're allowed to have a charitable status by definition wow. is because they can prove that it brings a sense of well-being to the to humans. It's not uh -huh. just because we're saving animals. That is not considered yeah, charitable. That's in interesting. Itself. Yeah. So there's one of the other challenges you asked about before of one of the obstacles is the institutionalization of philanthropy does mm -hmm. not necessarily support the animal or environmental mm -hmm. factors that like so that's right. causes. So up until recently, another thing about Canada that's messed up in the institutionalization of legal legal framework is that any advocacy activities were not considered charitable. So if uh, you were becoming you were uh, allowed 10% of your activities okay. to be political. And this is any form of advocacy. And if you think about, even in the context outside of animals and humans, let's think about it, of an organization that's fighting against, let's say, lung cancer. They're trying mm -hmm. to help support research and stuff. They would not be allowed to attack the lead cause of lung cancer, let's say, by advocating against stronger laws against cigarette use, against you know, the fact that how can cigarettes with this many chemicals still be legal, basically? Right. All of the advocacy aspect would not be considered charitable. Wow. And, and so th there's this disconnect of, OK, but if we want to solve the problem, we need to solve the roots of the problem, which are often based in legislation, based on how our society conceives of these issues. Mm -hmm. So if you rewind it back to animals in the environment, our whole system and our capitalist system is based on humans, of course, mm -hmm. which is normal. And it's, I'm not critiquing mm -hmm. it. I'm just saying that it's a fact that our system and what we've been creating has been to promote human development, which yeah. I totally understand. And as a species, we should prioritize our own species. It's, it's, it's natural. And I think it's, it's, it's crazy to say that it's not, it's true. We will always protect our family first. I hope so. If you don't protect your child first versus another one, like, I think that's kind of messed up too. Yeah. But of course, as we move on, we're starting to understand that we are part of a bigger system. And if we do want to take care of our species, we have to take care of everyone else as well. And we have to take care of the system in which we work. And yes. the, the sector is starting to evolve in that front. But if we look at the specific of the around advocacy, all of the issues of to protecting of, of defending the cause comes down to policy. The laws were not made to protect animals. They're actually almost against animals to be able to exploit animals for the human gain. So right. all of the co and the environment is the same thing. Yes. Even in economics, we don't take into consideration the environmental loss, the cost of losing our biodiversity, the loss of the ecosystem services. We don't take that into consideration right. in our lives. So yeah. what do our animal and environmental nonprofits have to do? Advocacy. They have to yeah. spread education. They have to be lobbying for legal changes to protect um, the environment. Even and it's connected, so connected to humans that it makes me insane. The pesticide questions, for example, which is destroying our soils, is destroying our biodiversity, is also causing lots of harm to humans. And yeah. so these organizations need to be fighting for legal legislative change. Yeah. But yeah. up until 2018, it was not allowed. Environment, yeah. so many environmental charities lost their status as charities, so they were not yeah. able to get tax receipts which made them seem less legitimate in the eyes of donors, mm -hmm. which obviously impacted the cause. So if we bring this all back to the, if the difficulties in becoming fundraising experts is because the sector is not made, has not been structured, at least in Canada, from, from my experience, to support those causes as much. Yeah. So some of the it's, root causes. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, in the U.S., um, we... 501c3 nonprofit organization, tax-exempt organizations, are able to advocate... And I had a guest who's a big advocate of ag advocacy on a few weeks ago and uh, really enlightened us about how much we're able to do that as nonprofits in the U.S. But, you know, her, her statement, and I think it's right on, is if you're not advocating, you're not fulfilling your mission. You're missing a huge chunk of your mission because you can fight 
you can help people all day long or help animals or the environment all day long. But if you're not advocating for systems change, it, it's not going to happen. I mean, the changes just aren't going to stick. They're temporary or, or partially there. So anyway, just to add that and you know, um, you this isn't the episode to go down the rabbit hole about how much advocacy are you allowed to do and all that mm-hmm. stuff and lobbying and all that. That's a different episode, but um, you can go watch my the episode I had on that um, a few weeks ago. But anyway, I just wanted to put a pin in that that advocacy it should be part of the work that nonprofits do. Definitely, and of course, the rabbit hole is a very deep one, and we should not. Go it into is, it. but. <laughs> I think that it's it's right on. And that's where I've often made the difference between charity and what I consider as philanthropy or systems change philanthropy, at least, mm-hmm. is are we trying to actually solve the problem or are we trying to just also give ourselves this feeling of, look at me, I'm doing something good. And that becomes my identity. I'm going to bring up a point that my partner actually made me realize when I was very much involved in the activist movement. He's like, your identity is so directly connected to animal rights and to animal cruelty that you would not be able to be you unless there were people causing harm to, harm to, causing harm to animals. And that just made me, whoa, this is so true. If I'm not actually trying to get these people on board and, and get them involved and actually understand them, then I'm just creating this even wider divide of vegans can only exist if there's non-vegans. Yeah environmentalists can only exist if there's non-environmentalists. And so we have to understand that creating that divide in the sector is what's also perpetuating the problem to a certain degree. So I think that there, there's definitely has to be a shift where we start understanding our role as in perpetuating these issues within the sector, self-reflect, let your ego aside. No one's perfect. You're not perfect let's see how can we get more people involved to changing that perspective of us against them and realizing that we're all in this together. And I think, I know that sounds very cheesy, but that's the only way we're going to actually succeed in this as a group, yes. as a collective. And so that coming back to your point about the charity of like, yes, you can, you can spend thousands of dollars saving this one cat that was abandoned and abused. Great. That's awesome. But if you're not also focusing on trying to stop the source of the problem of why are people neglecting cats? Why are people neglecting dogs? Why are people still mistreating animals in in industrial farms? Why are we still, you know, literally just shoving chemicals and pesticides onto our fields? Why are we doing this? And understanding that and attacking the root cause, I think is something that is is more missing. But then there's the fundraising aspect that comes into play of, it's not as easy to sell. It's true. It's not. There's so much backlash against it. Um, and and I, just in the animal sector. It's everywhere. No, absolutely. I would, I, I say you come back and we dig into that more because <laughs> I'll tell you what, people are commenting on this topic. They're loving it. They're interested in it. So I am going to invite you back um, to have, to dig in, in even deeper if you want to, of course. Of course. <laughs> um, <laughs> excuse me I also want you to talk about your podcast because yes. I think this is great and I want to I want to spread the word and help you out with your getting started on it so tell it talk about that yes so after meeting with countless nonprofits, of really working with them of talking to different consultants as well in the sector and then doing my own research I realized there's there's not many resources specifically on non-human philanthropy you'll have people talking about animal rights great they don't talk about the running of the nonprofit part and then it, they, you'll have people talking about running a nonprofit, but not about the specifics about running it yeah. for animals in the environment so i wanted to create this platform to to showcase the specificity specificity specificities that's a very yeah that's a tough one <laughs> of the non-human uh, the non-human philanthropy yeah. world and getting people to understand each other and creating the sense of community of we're working together, creating collaboration and giving practical advice on fundraising, on running your nonprofit to specifically these organizations and how we can overcome a lot of these obstacles around the laws, around grant making, around the fact that there's only 3% of all grant making and all philanthropic funds that goes towards animals in the environment. How can we make this a change? And we can only do that if we work together. So I 
I don't have a title yet. So far, it's just the non-human philanthropy podcast project that I've been asking. And I really want feedback from people to better understand what are their podcasts like habits so I can gear it more towards their needs, what they feel is the biggest obstacles in their organizations or in organizations that they volunteer with, or you don't have to work in the field, but be interested and engaged somewhat in the non-human philanthropy space. So right now I did create a survey. Um, I think I sent it to you if ever you could share that in the chat. Yeah, I'm going to share it right now. So I'm looking um, for feedback from anyone that's closely related to the field to just understand more about their habits, what they feel needs to be talked about more. And of course, um, I'd love to have more speakers. So if, if there's anyone that's interested in becoming a guest on the podcast, I'm starting to already build my schedule. My first objective is to do 12 nonprofits, 12 provinces, so 12 provinces of Canada, 12 different causes, and then finding 12 different like challenges they face in the operational and finding solutions live. So it's really about giving practical advice while also doing a landscaping of the sector. And then the next step would be obviously getting into the States and maybe in Mexico, who knows, but the, the, it'll be mostly focused on North America for now. That's great. So I'm also going to put the link to Catherine's um, LinkedIn that she shared with me um, because she is encouraging you to get in touch with her. If this is something that you're interested in. And I know people are, cause they're commenting like mad out there. So um, I want to thank you for being here today and for spending time with us and um, meeting with me last week. This has been incredible. I know a lot of people, um, this really resonated with them. So um, My pleasure. and appreciate your time so much. No, of course it was. So it was really fun. I'm really, I oh, love talking. And there, yeah. And come back soon. Get, you know, I'll send you the link to get. Let's talk about advocacy. Then. Yeah. I'd love to get, hear your progress. And I know everybody else would too. So next week, join us. Our guest will be Danette O'Connell with the Nonprofit Cooperative. And she's going to be talking about the importance of free services and unrestricted funds to nonprofits. Another topic that I think uh, resonates with people related to fundraising. That's one of the hottest topics there is. So Catherine, again, thank you so, so much. I hope you have a wonderful day. Keep doing what you're doing because this is important work. It really is. Yes. Never stop. All right, good. Thanks, you all, and have a good week out there, and we'll see you soon.